thank you for being here today and having us. We're so excited. I'm Rebecca Mason, owner of Love and Train Them. This is Meredith. I'm an associate trainer with Love and Train Them. Yeah, my name's Anthony, and I'm a trainer too. So that's where we are. Uh, we train at uh, four different locations in our Birmingham right now, and um, we're all about um, just really educating the owners. Um, it's easy to train someone's dog, but then the dog goes home and the owner is like, so we're all about educating people. We like to educate staff at places like this. Uh, we like to educate our owners, your family members, and the dogs too. Mm -hmm. And kids. 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 Yes, oh, everyone in the family. I'm a parent. Yeah. Uh, I used to be an elementary teacher. <laughs> so we do kids clinics too. Like I did one this week for a Boy Scout troop at oh, a church, cool. teaching them about dog bite prevention and how to handle properly, how um, not to stick your face down there. Yeah. And, but in like fun, silly ways that it gets to be loud and yeah. kind of interactive. So Mary's going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so I made a PowerPoint that kind of geared towards how you guys will manage play groups and daycare, but it's also just how you interact with dogs in general, because you have to start with that foundation. You're not going to be good at play group management if you don't understand how to work with a dog one-on-one -on -one first. So the beginning of this presentation is all about how to have an ethical relationship with a dog. So it's all about how we try and communicate with these animals that don't speak English. So Rebecca's going to talk about body language and then also the training methodology we, we use, which is positive reinforcement training. Um, and then we're also going to learn about handling techniques. It's okay. We're used to it. I was surprised he's been quiet this time. So, let him, let him be dogs. <laughs> yeah, so um, I work at the Shelby Humane Society, and he volunteers there a lot too. So talk about dogs stressed out in kennels. So we have to be really careful about how we handle dogs. So it's about our approach to that situation, and then also different tools that we can have. And he's going to go over that, the handling techniques. And then I'm going to go over play group management. I used to manage a doggy daycare in Georgia for two years when I lived there after grad school. I worked there, and I've always lived in a house that has a pack of dogs in it, whether it's my own or my own plus fostering dog. So I feel like I've lived in a doggy daycare for the past eight years of my life. Um, yeah, so without further ado, Rebecca's going to jump right into talking about ethical relationships with dogs. Let's talk about that. <laughs> okay, so. At the core of what we do is science-based training. This means we are using methods that have been proven through actual research to be effective and humane, okay? So when we talk about this, um, you, you're thinking about things like dogs are visual learners, they're not auditory learners. So if you try to teach a dog a new skill using like just sit, they're less likely to do that than using a hand signal or something like that. I actually went to a seminar recently. Uh, this great guy from the UK came over and he was talking about how if you have a dog who knows the verbals and the hand signals for different commands, nine out of 10 dogs, if you say sit but gesture down, will lay down. So they are visual. And that is one of the first things we talk to our clients about is, is stop just yelling English words at them and expecting them to know what it means. You know, teach them in a way that they need to learn, right? Um, learning is very specific. Um, dogs don't generalize very easily. Uh, if you have a dog who's only been taught something by one person, they're going to struggle to do that with a different person. If they've only been trained in one place, and they're in a new place with new distractions or new sounds or movement that they're not used to, they're going to struggle also. And a lot of owners get really stressed and angry and they call their dog the word that I hate the most. And they know what this word is, it's stubborn. I hate this word because they've had a dog that they've trained in a group class at a training center. They train it at their home and in their yard, but now they're going to do dog day. And that's thousands of dogs. And they say, he's not doing it. He's so stubborn. And I'm like, no, he's never been taught to do this in this place with these dogs and these distractions. So it's actually about reasonable expectations, and it's about context and like, what can he do successfully? We want to grow past that, but you can't go from teaching a dog a skill at this level to expecting them to do it at this level. There's all these steps, like a staircase in between. And until you train them to get to here, you can't have a dog who's trained here and get frustrated and call them stubborn because they can't do it at this level. And there's tons of steps between the people tend to skip those steps a lot of the time. Okay, um, we never want to stress a dog during handling be it in this kind of environment or in a training class, 
Um, dogs who appear stressed, you'll see some body language slides about stress. I'm sure you've seen that in boarding situations. Dogs get stressed. Um, if the dog is stressed, they can't learn. Um, the fear center of the brain is also the learning center of the brain. So if we get a dog in class who is clearly stressed, they're not taking food, this is not a dog who's going to be able to learn. In which case, that is not the environment for this dog. Maybe they could work up to doing a group class after doing something on wood or something, but we're never going to go, oh, well, there you go. We're not going to just keep that dog in that situation. That's a dog we're going to pull out for the good of the dog. That we don't want to create more negative associations with new places or dogs or strangers or whatever it is that's triggering that dog. So. Um, Positive training is, is a, it's, it's not just the science of it though, it's, it's a bigger concept. Like we're never going to physically threaten a dog or use force with a dog or use aversive tools with a dog because all of these things damage the bond between the handler and the dog. Um, real obedience that sticks and lasts comes from the relationship. It's about the relationship. It's not owner, the dog is my slave. I hate the word obedience. I hate that word. Obey. Like, we call it beginner obedience because that's what most people call it, but I don't think of it as that way at all. Training is a conversation. It's a relationship. You're communicating something you'd like them to do, but they're dogs. They're not going to do it just because. They have to be motivated to do it. And that's when we get into rewards and what is rewarding to the dog and all of that, right? Think about, like, one of my dogs loves food. He would do anything for food, anything, but he does not care about toys. He could care less. If it's moving, he'll start to walk toward it until it stops moving, and then he's not interested anymore. So what is rewarding to one dog may not be to another dog. People will say, oh, it, it's okay, I just praise him and tell him good boy. A lot of dogs couldn't give a crap about that. Um, <laughs> one of mine, if I praise him, he'll feel next to me 20 minutes and just look at me like, she wants me, I love this. But the other two, psh, whatever, you gotta have food or you gotta have a frisbee yeah. with my other two. Like, frisbee will get you what you want. Okay, so dogs have different motivators. We shouldn't just expect them to do it because we fed. That's not a relationship, okay? So, um, as far as learning theory, all, it, it can get really technical, but I wanna take the technical out of it. Um, we have what we call the four, <laughs> oh my. <laughs> The four quadrants, okay? So on the left side, this is what we do, okay? On the right side, this is what your more traditional trainers do. Okay. So we use positive reinforcement, which means reinforcement just means I want the behavior to happen again. Positive means you add something. In learning theory, positive doesn't mean good, it means the addition of something, like a reward or something like that. So positive reinforcement means we add something that makes the behavior more likely to occur. Example, I'm leash walking with my dog, he's walking nice, I add a treat, he's more likely to do that again, right? And then the, the second part of that is negative punishment. That sounds like I'm smacking dogs. That is not what that is. Scientifically speaking, negative means the removal of something Punishment means to make it more less likely to occur. So for example, my dog is pulling on the leash, I quit walking, that's the removal of the movement, to make the pulling less likely to occur. So positive force, reinforcement, negative punishment, those two go together. That's two sides of a coin. The other two sides are positive punishment and negative reinforcement. This is what your more traditional trainers use. Um, we're not that, because it's not based on science. Um, positive punishment would be adding something to make a behavior stop. This would be like hitting a dog, shocking a dog, jerking a dog on a prong, many other examples of things, right? Um, negative reinforcement would be taking something away to make something more likely to happen. This would be like, um, say you have an off-leash dog on a shock collar, the prong to come, it's not coming, so they hold out the shock, and when the dog starts running toward them, they release it. So it's a removal of something to make something more likely to occur. So it's a little tricky with positive, negative, or reinforced, uh, all that. But that's the four. So we always stay on this side. We're never, ever going to lose this side. Because when you do a lot of those things, you lose the animal's trust. They know who put the collar on them. They're very aware. That's why I got bit six months ago. I was putting a harness on a dog. Uh, the last person to put something on him was a trainer putting on a shot collar. So. <laughs> so we never want to put ourselves in a situation that's going to get us injured or make the dog feel threatened and shut down because of course if they're afraid they can't learn, right? All right, body language is how they communicate. 
we tend to communicate with words, but also with expressions. Dogs communicate with their body and expressions. So this is a great little graphic, and we're going to send you guys a bunch of resources like this stuff to send to your staff, too. Um, this is just a great little chart. Have y'all seen this before? It's adorable. I love this stuff. Um, it's just these little, um, his website has so many of these great little graphics like this, but on different topics. Um, all the different ways a dog can manipulate their body to show you a different emotion. And some of them are such small things. Like if you look at alert and suspicious, what changed there? Alert, the tail. Mm, yeah, the, yeah, the tail went up. Good catch, it's very small. <laughs> the tail went up and the weight was shifted forward, right? So like in daycare, if you see this, it doesn't mean the same thing as that. And the more you guys know, the more you're arming yourself with information to prevent a fight, right? So some of these are really obvious, like this dog is ticked. Um, but turning their head away is saying like, hey, I come in peace, I don't want any trouble. A lot of the time when people on leash, I see this a lot in class, they want their dogs to say hi. And one dog is like, what's up, come on. And the other dog is like, uh, this isn't happening. I don't see you. And I was like, there, go see her. And he's like, <laughs> and, and that's just, he's displacing the stress. He's like, I'm just going to pretend this isn't there. So looking away is a sign of stress. But we've been thinking about that. We just think he's looking at something. But there's a lot of things like that. So we're going to make sure you guys get copies of that. <laughs> Ears. So. Um, the pitch and the height of the ear and where the ears are shifting is definitely something to look at. But you never want to just look at one thing. You want to look at the whole body. For example, my Pomeranian's ears are always like this. <laughs> they just, they will tilt their little satellite dishes, but they're always like this. So you get a bagel looking at her and he's like, she's ticked, right? But they just look different. Sometimes they have to communicate because of differences in their physiology. But we can look at little shifts though, because if you look, both of these dogs have floppy ears, their ears are gonna be down, right? But if you look at how these are kind of just chilling out on the side, but these are coming forward, so they're shifting here. Um, so it's that little bitty difference, whereas here they're peeled back against the head. That's a dog who is nervous. But you can also tell by other things with the body. Okay, she's hunkered down, her eyes, the tail's kind of a little bit lower. So, you know, and this dog, you can look, the eyes are relaxed, the mouth is relaxed, it's also a happy dog. This dog's mouth is closed. So it won't always be that way, but a lot of the time, um, a mouth is a good way to look at to me. If the mouth looks really relaxed and everything else looks relaxed, it's probably all right. But a lot of the time when dogs are not sure, the first thing they'll do is their mouth will shut. Like, oh, you know, I, I always look for that. Anything you want to add about yours? $20 Okay, eyes! Relaxed eyes. They're kind of half slanty, just happy, happy eyes. The aroused eyes are big and open. Uh, in my kids' clinics, we talk about the, uh, the crescent moon eye. You can see the lights of the eyes. It's called a whale eye. That means you better stay back right now. We talk a lot about that. I made them look at lots of pictures of dogs and tell me if it was a yes or no kind of dog. Um, with the scared dogs, obviously, we know what this looks like. Everybody's seen this. Uh, the wrinkle on the brow, um, a lot of the time you see the tucked body posture. This dog is looking out the side of the eye, you'll see that a lot too, where they don't want to look at you, but they're keeping an eye on you because they're not too sure about you. So always that's look at mouth too. That's yes. tight mouth too. Yes. Tight mouth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Catch. So you add the mouth, right? So here, okay, let's look at the stressed one first. So this dog has shut its mouth. You can look at the eyes, the way it's hunkering down, the ears, the whole thing says stress. A lot of people will look at this mouth and say, oh, this dog is happy, smiling. No, he's not, he's stressed out. Um, when you see the folds of the mouse, the commissure's coming back, it should make kind of a C if they're happy, but this is like a sharp V. It's pulled way back, like as far as it can go, and you've got a huge O tongue hanging out. Is either a dog who's hot or stressed out, right? His tongue's hanging out a little bit longer than you typically see in relax, but he's outside, he might be hot, who knows. And a lot of the times, again, the mouth will shut here. Or you'll see that kind of, that kind of thing, that thing. See that too. Position of the body. Is it going forward? Is it going back? Is it hunkering? Is it tucking? Is it loose and relaxed? Um, with the kids, I talk about, you know, if the body's just kind of, the whole body's doing this kind of thing, and I make them do this. They're like, you know, this is usually a dog who's happy if you look at the rest of the picture too, right? But a wagging tail doesn't always mean a friendly dog. This is usually not good. 
this. It's like, I want to like you, but I'm just not sure about you. Um, first it's just snapping and loose and floppy. It looks like my dog. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is something that I'm really passionate about teaching people about, especially kids, but all people. That growling is communication, and communication is good. Growling is helpful information for the owner's trainer and for them to know. People want to pop their dog or silence their dog when they growl, but as you're going to see in a second, a growl is one of the last warnings a dog gives you before they're going to bite. So if you teach a dog to not growl, they're going to go right to the bite. That is not okay. So it's, it's information, we need information. If the dog growls, the first thing you do is back away and give it space. Be like, hey, I heard you. Teaching a dog that it's not allowed to growl is like telling me I'm not allowed to go, um, can you back up if someone gets right up in my face? That would be wrong. I just should be able to tell you how they're feeling. How else do you don't know? Like people who work with dogs, we can look at lower uh, rung kind of signs of stress like this. This is called the ladder of aggression. So growling is right here, right? And you have snapping and biting. Down here you have all these things that a lot of people, even people who work with dogs or have had dogs 50, 50, 60 years of their life, do not know these things. Uh, the parents at the Cub Scout meeting did not know a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to blink, they're going to yawn, lick their nose or their lips. A lot of people don't know, they see a dog yawning and they think he's just tired. Um, a lot of the time it's, he's stressed and he's trying to displace it and put it somewhere. Um, again, turning their head or body away, we talked about that. Walking away, creeping down, putting their ears back. My mom's dog does this a lot. Crouching, tucking the tail. Everybody kind of knows that one. Um, lying down with their leg up. <laughs> a lot of people don't think about this. They think, oh, dog's laying down with his leg up. He wants me to pet his belly. But a lot of dogs will just be kind of like a submissive breeze, and they'll lay like that. Please don't hurt me. I mean, no harm, no threat. So, if you don't mind if I interject, we have a lot of dogs that'll come into the daycare yard, brand new dogs mm -hmm. that are just getting introduced, and they'll immediately go to their back like uh -huh. this and lift their leg uh -huh. when the other yes. dogs are approaching them. Yeah. And so, in my mind, that always mm -hmm. just meant they're just kind of passive. They're coming in like a, I'm not trying to be alpha. Mm -hmm. Just, I don't mean any harm. Kind of like I don't mean any said. harm. I think, yeah, I would look at... But if it's a stress signal, should we be changing I would that? be looking at the whole picture, probably. Like, if the other dog moves away, then he's like, okay, whatever. Right. Then they communicate. I think it is a communication. Mm -hmm. You want to add anything to that? You know, yeah. everybody's going to get sniffed when they first come yeah, in. Yeah, for sure. They just usually will let them go, okay, just go right to that. I mean, me. stress mm -hmm. is a part of everyday life. Yeah, like, whenever you, whenever you as a person enter a novel situation, there's some stress, correct? Mm -hmm. So as long as the dog is communicating at the lower level of the ladder and you're backing the dog up and saying, I recognize this dog is mildly stressed, what can I do to prevent that dog from escalating? So when you have a dog come into a play group, the worst possible thing is to have that new dog meet eight new dogs oh, in yeah, a right. space at the we same don't time. So you should leave the dog in and maybe just meet one dog mm -hmm. that's really calm and then gradually yeah. let the other ones out. That's how and then yes, testing. good. Yeah. You have to well when you bring the dogs in even after the test, you should do that too. Okay. Um, if you notice a dog is is always coming in, rolling over, communicating mild signs of stress, because the one day that it becomes even more for her, mm -hmm. she's gonna escalate up that ladder. Mm -hmm. And then that's where more serious things happen. Mm -hmm. So you have to back her up. Kind of like when you hear a growl, you gotta back that dog up um, and listen to her because she's trying to communicate, not yeah. just to the other dogs, but then if you read that dog language and back her up and make it easier for her, that'll be better. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, a lot of people don't know about the yawning. Like, you guys may not know about that. I don't know. Getting stiff and staring, you see that? And then here's growl. So, so if you Punish a dog for growling. See, this owner, my friends, my best friend from childhood, his head hated when the dog growled. He would always yell at him or pop him. So you just remove that. So then you go from a dog who's doing something like the leg up to biting. Mm -hmm. And you're like, this dog bit with no warning. Right. It's because you took the warning away, right. right? So growling is some of the best information that they can possibly give you. And besides giving them space immediately, your next thing is to say, okay, what were some things going on in that context of that environment? What were some of the triggers? What can we do to prevent that happening, or to manage it better? And then getting the dog with a trainer who uses science-based training, who can actually desensitize the dog to those types of things um, over time, which is no, no slow process. But the first thing is give space, 
then assess later what can we do to prevent this, what can we do to manage this, right? And some dogs, like, they're just not going to be daycare kind of dogs. Right. Some of our clients would lose it if they went to daycare. Right. And there are some where I'll be like, no, 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 that's not a good idea. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, because you never just want to flood them by just throwing them in. That's terrifying. That'll make it worse. Yes. Okay. All right. So, handling, okay? Handling a dog happens before we even put a leash on it, okay? A lot of it has to do with the communication that we display to the dog, right? And harping on dog body language, if you can observe that a dog is stressed, then you can better prepare yourself for handling that dog specifically, right? Every dog's different. Every dog's situation is different as they're coming in the door, right? It could be a dog that's been to five different daycares and they get here and they know the drill and they don't like it. So if we can read that, then we can better prepare ourselves to manage him, right? Make it as comfortable as possible for him or her. Uh, but also knowing that if we see a dog that's stressed, let's manage the situation, okay? So the stories we tell our dogs, okay? Everyone's been there where we've tried to display some type of emotion or action from them and they're doing the complete opposite, right? Or they act like they don't know what they're saying, okay? Sometimes, for example, an owner will ask a dog to come to them, okay? And if their body posture is bending over like this, that's telling the dog to get back. I'm scary, get back, okay? And we've all seen dogs do this now where we try to, no, come on, it's okay, you know? But that's the miscommunication that we're having with them, okay? But instead, if we think of it a little bit differently and use our body posture to convey those messages correctly, then we can get those actions out of them that we want. We turn to the side, if we bend over, if we offer food, or even just throw food on the ground and let it be their choice to go get the food, okay, now our trust is building with them. Because the dogs that come in, they're not our dogs, right? Uh, but if we can build that level of trust from the get-go, then we can have more success in getting them from place point A to point B, putting leashes on them, taking leashes off, doing all those things that are necessary to run this business, right? But reading them is big time, okay? And also reading ourselves. You know, a lot of it comes with, or at least from my, our experience, uh, filming ourselves working with the dogs, too. You pick up on so many things that subconsciously you're doing that you don't even realize, you know, whether it is bending over or turning around um, or just up and down quick movements. Sometimes that startles dogs, you know, but let's say if that is the case, right, you bend down to pick up something and a dog jumps back, okay? Mental note, okay, this dog, very motion sensitive, you know, err on the side of caution when you're handling him, right? And communication between you guys too, because if you handle a dog and you're like, all right, this one, Take it easy, no loud sounds if you can. Some of it you can't control, but you relate that to another person, we're all setting each other up for success, right? So communication between you guys, communication between you and the dog, right? Um, and just think about it. As, as long as you know or have an idea of what they're telling you, okay? And if you have an idea of what you're telling the dog by your body posture and your movements, then you can set up everyone for success, right? It's not perfect. Things are going to happen, right? But the more we know, the better, okay? Um, as you can see right here, this first picture, hands towards the dog, threatening movements, right? See this dog's body posture, the eyes, the body, low, kind of shine away. This person right here, is bending to the side, offering treats, not going towards the dog. That's big time, especially when it comes to putting leashes on, and I'll show you in a second. But... The more that we can make it the dog's choice to want to do these actions, whether it's going through a threshold, thresholds are troublesome, right? Um, making it their choice to do something empowers them to be in control of their environment. Uh, and it can go a long way when it is their choice and we're not having to force them to do things. Okay. So, oh no. Uh, I know the issue. I'm gonna send you guys these videos because they're uploaded on my Google Drive. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, but uh, they're pretty great videos. I'm proud of them. <laughs> Either way, uh, I'll give you live demos here with this guy. Uh, but what this slide is about is putting leashes on the dogs, okay? Like I said, it can be a very threatening gesture if you actively try to put a leash on a dog forward motion towards their face, okay? A lot of times they'll shy away, uh, maybe even jump up at you if that's, not, if that's the case. Uh, but the idea is we want it to be their choice, okay? The way we do that is use motivators, whether it's a toy, whether it's food, um, something that they're interested in, right? But 
but that's not enough, okay? We want it to be their choice to go in and out. As the dog gets comfortable doing that, then they can understand, oh yeah, when you put this thing on me, I get a tasty treat each time or something like that. That's simple. <laughs> Same thing with entry into a kennel. If a dog's nervous about going back into a kennel or going into a kennel for the first time, try to set yourself up to have a little window of time to let the dog make the choice to go in there, right? Because a lot of times you'll see them go in, come out, go in halfway, come out, or even just freeze. That's generally their last you know, stand is, I'm just gonna freeze and you're gonna have to throw me in there. Right? We don't wanna get to that point. We want it to be their choice to go in. So if that is the case with the threshold or with a kennel door, try to load up the ground beforehand. Then you could put treats or food right at the threshold so that way their curiosities peak from the get-go, okay? Uh, another option would just be showing them a treat, letting them eat it from your hand, and then kind of slowly leading the bread trail toward the place, you know? Um, again, these aren't necessarily time-savvy techniques, but if you're able to set it up for success, you can see progress, right? And they're not perfect, uh, and I'm sure you come up with creative ways to do that as well. But just know that we want it to be their choice to go into these things, because it's not natural. Um, they're meant to be free wild animals, right? So Homer here is going to demonstrate how we put a leash on a dog properly. A slip lead, by the way. These are not um, clip-on collars, uh, slip leads. Is that what you guys use yeah. here? Um, do they look like this? They're oh. flat. They're flat. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That one's gone. Flat one. These are much easier uh, because of the technique I'll show you when we take it off. But the idea with a slip lead, okay, is that we want the opening to be as big as possible before we put it on them. Right? We want it to be as less constrictive instead of, I don't know how to say this, but we want it to be, be sly about putting it on them. Right? We wanted them to barely notice the thing. Okay? So the way I like to do it is I have this handle part towards me. Okay? If I'm standing on this side of him, handles towards me. The okay? reason being, it's a slip lead. We want slack, we can let go or let low and then pull it up and now it's on them. Okay? So, People will say a P or a Q, that always confuses me. So I always uh, think about it as the handle towards you. That's the easiest way. But again, we want security, so we just, at the end of the day, we want it to be on them. Right. Don't get too crazy about tech, um, be technical. So, okay, the hole is big, okay? Food motivators in our free hand, okay? If we just hold this in front of the dog and have the treats right here, curiosity generally is gonna be P. And then he may, stick his head halfway in and back out, okay? Uh, but eventually, you know, that reward's gonna happen. Again, we're not moving this towards them. We want them to willingly put their head into it. Um, so if you hold the food right here, head will get closer and closer. Once they're through and eating the food out of your hand, all you're doing is just, you're just letting go, right, and holding the hand. So at that point, we never made any intrusive actions towards them, right? It was their choice to come through and willingly put it on. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many dogs are like, oh yeah, I'll put that thing on my head, right? Right through it. Uh, rewards are happening. They're associating the leash with good things. That's the positive reinforcement. Uh, again, and we're not, we're not actively doing things to them, okay? Because that's where the shying away and the stress peaks, and then they associate this thing with a person sticking their hand in my face, right? And they don't want that. So. We have a handful yeah. of dogs that I would say, and if you guys can jump in, probably 85% of our dogs are perfectly fine being slip leaded. But we've got the other 15%, the Logans and the those kind of dogs that are um, that are very leery of every move we make. So this is yeah. this kind of stuff will be really helpful for those. Mm -hmm. Like when we're listening to all this, I'm hoping everybody's thinking of the Logans and the whoever the other, that other dog was recently. Um, of the world. Yeah. Really yeah. Treat driven, yeah. Treat-driven, ball driven, yeah. frisbees, maybe even a scarf. They're like, what is that thing? Yeah. Uh, or a towel or something that they like. Every dog has something. It may not be a physical something. It may just be you talking to them, right? Or it may take another person to pet them and then you can kind of have their attention elsewhere while you do that, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of tactics you can use, but the main thing we don't want to do is force anything onto them. Right, because then they just associate the stress with that. Um, remind me at the end if you guys have a Wi-Fi code. Um, 
I'll show. I do have these videos uploaded to YouTube, so we can pull them off okay. and show them. It'll be the whole process. But in this picture right here, this has to do with which side the handle's on. Um, realistically, the correct way is like I said, with the handle towards you, because if you just let go, that's where the slip happens, right? It goes down. But if it was the other way, and you let go, it nothing's gonna happen, right? So it's meant to be for an easy exit. Uh, but there's another way I'll show you in a second how to get it off. But again, we just need it on them and secure. Right. Okay. Okay, what about yeah. having hyper dogs? Hyper dogs. That are like if you try and put a leash or a harness on them, mm -hmm. they're just like all over the, the place leash. and won't sit yeah. still and Well, I would think that that would fall along with reading them from the get go. Right, so if you, are, if you know that this dog is going to be hyper, okay, give them a second to cool down, right? Take your time uh, in the sense of unless there's an emergency happening and we need it right now, no need to rush that situation. Um, simple hand, like simple focus stuff or showing them a treat or even just letting them eat a treat for free um, can kind of center them a little bit, right? Let the fireworks simmer down and then go through the process. Yeah, uh, that would be my advice. But if you're in there with the hot dog, just give it some time, right? Um, but yeah, because if you think about it, if a dog's at a 10 and you come in and you're trying to do more things to them, there's only one way to go, and it's going to be exploding. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm going to talk a little bit about yeah. environment yeah. cues. Leashing up the play group is always a challenge. Curious to absolutely, so absolutely, yeah. Let's see. Oh yeah, you have to get him in that like smaller yard, and then get him in like the smaller, smaller yard, and then the first one you take a deep breath. Mm-hmm. Yep. You'd be surprised too at how often when you take a deep breath, your dog will take a deep breath with you, and because they read us like as far as our body language goes, right? If we're stressed about something, okay, that's going to trickle down. So be really mindful about how where your mental state is, just in that moment, because they're gonna read that and they're gonna say, oh man, what's, what's going on, right? So just take a deep breath and then communicate with the dog. It's y'all two at that point, hopefully, unless you're in a play group, then you gotta kind of make adjustments, but so. Now, as far as you got the leash on the dog, okay? Now, security as far as holding the leash, okay? There's two different methods that are called the leash lock, and it works best with the flat collars. Those, um, it, it definitely works, but it's easier with this. So, there's two methods of holding a leash that are secure, and they each have two points of security as well, uh, as kind of like a backup plan if you were to let go of one, okay? The first one is with your thumb. And it's pretty simple. All you're going to do is put your thumb through the handle hole, okay? Make a loop that goes over your pointer finger, okay? So it looks like that. So then at that point, you're just grabbing the rope itself, okay? You're not wrapping it around your hand, okay? Uh, that can get really sketchy, especially the thinner the leash is, the more damage is done, could be done to your hand. You can break bones and just get crazy bruises. But the idea is you're only holding the leash, all right? Also, placement of where you hold this leash is important too. If you hold it towards your waist, you have a lower center of gravity. If a dog is pulling like crazy, you can hold it lower, all right, and you're not gonna topple over. You hold it up high, don't pull too hard. <laughs> <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna get pulled in a direction, right? The idea is you wanna keep it as low as possible. That way, when they're pulling, it's only pulling right here, not me going over, okay? so. Leash placement is important, but this <laughs> lock itself, thumb through the hole, looping it over the finger. You could loop it over a couple fingers if you want. Uh, but they're pulling just on the pointer finger, not your whole wrist. Okay? Now, let's say if you were to let go of the finger, you still have something on the leash. Okay? Uh, it's not ideal that you get to this point, but it's a backup plan. Okay? As far as any training or handling goes, you want to have a... a Plan A and then a plan B, right? <coughs> if you're grooming a dog, you want to have them kind of 
two different things in case one breaks and they're not running around with scissors and buzzers and stuff. So thumb is one, and like I said, I'll send you videos of this. The other one is your wrist, okay? Slip it through your wrist, same thing. Holding it right over your finger. Okay, they're gonna pull on that. If you let go, it's still gonna be around your wrist. Okay, so that's the two points of safety with that. Uh, but it helps to practice, you know, because it, it can become second nature to put on a leash like that on your hand. Uh, but just practicing makes a big difference too. That's with a lot of these handling techniques. Putting a leash on a dog, practice with your own dogs at home. You know, I mean, it makes total sense to do that with a calm dog, right? Or even get them excited and then practice that at home too, you know? Uh, but you have perfect training tools at home waiting on you that miss you. All right, here we go. Okay. So, a slip lead harness, okay? Have y'all heard of that or tried that at all? To make one? Yes, I've heard of it, but I don't know. I'm gonna show you. So, <coughs> this constitutes with a dog that's pulling like crazy, right? And we wanna have less stress on their neck, all right? It's important the less, as least, as little amount of stress as possible, okay? So, um, what, if this is something that you're interested in or you need to do with your dog, by all means, do it. Um, so, you have the slip lead already on them, okay? All you're gonna do is run the lead, okay, under their belly, yeah, see that. and then through this loop right here, okay? I'm thinking about Domino's right now, not me. Yeah, Domino would be perfect for candy. <laughs> so, but the idea is, all right, less stress on their neck, okay? And this is more secure. If you got a male dog, just make sure that this is up uh, under the armpits because you can get some, you can do some damage down here. No one wants that. Uh, so keep it up here. Uh, again, I'll show you guys. This is something too. Practice with your dog at home. You know, the more savvy you can get with the leash, the better you're setting yourself up for success. So again, all right. Whichever side you're on, so the leash is going this way. Um, again, when it comes to handling a hyper dog, okay, it's easier said than done. All right, when I'm or the videos that I'll send to you guys, when I'm working with my dog putting it on her, my free hand has food in it and it's right here. So this leash is just I'm just doing this number right here. That number, good job, good job, boom, boom. Now we're secure. You know, um, again, diverting attention into something that they like only makes this process better for them, you know? Uh, as much as we can associate doing and blessing things with them with positive stuff, it just makes it a lot easier. But again, this this works best with this kind of leaf, but you can do it with any kind. Uh, and also, you can make any regular leaf into a leaf, into a slip leaf. Do um, you have any questions about this? you want to try? Someone can give it This is the entry of the leash. 
So see how her, she's putting her own face through it? I'm not moving my hand at all. Mm -hmm, but... And then she doesn't even know. Like when you're trying to give them treats, they'll grab a hold of them. So treat, I'll talk about that. So treat is part of handling. Treating, um... If you let the dog come to get the treat, they're going to do that. Right? The best way to treat a dog, and it's good practice too, is when you deliver it, actually deliver it. Um, don't go get it. Um, Hannah Brandon said something like this, uh, yeah. about it being a drive through window and not take out. You take out the night. Yeah. Yeah. So deliver it to them, but don't let them go get it. Okay? Uh, but yeah, that the delivery is important. If you give them a treat like this, or they're gonna come at them at this angle, they're gonna meet you halfway. That's usually what about taking off the collar with like the crazy? Like, Y'all know me that part. Oh, I'm gonna show you that. Thirteen. That you feel like you can barely get in and out. And she's getting more. I'm gonna. Uh, you talk about Molly. Was it Molly? Archie. Yeah. Or whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you, described, you described two different dogs. You said a crazy dog and then one that you... Like, there really there was one that was crazy, but there was one that was calmer. And they were in the same kennel together. And we could interact with the calmer one. But the crazy one, like, if you opened the door, he was in the corner. He was peeing. He was growling. The sister would hide him in the corner of her or, would she follow the brother at all? No. When she got her on the leash, yeah, then she would. It, it was like a negotiation. Like, yeah. Or if like, you open the door, like to the kennel, if you open the door and walk back and just gave her free reign to go with, mm -hmm. she would be okay with that. Yeah. But. That it was immediate. Go out, use the restroom, come right back. Well, in. that would work too if she was used to it. Like the first time yeah. I tried to do it, she pooped. He's like, yeah, you're not coming. Yeah, I would yeah. say too. So let's say there's certain dogs that respond to certain people, right? Yeah. If if that is a possibility here, let's say a dog responds to you more than you, and you're here and you're here, you take it over, yeah, right? Uh, if there's dogs that you're nervous about handling, find someone that's not and let them take it, right? One out of two Oh, is it Al Zoe? Yeah. <laughs> but that, that goes along with our body language telling them stories, right? If we're nervous, we go in there nervous, then they can be nervous, and then that's where everything trickles down. So, uh, yeah, if you're not confident, find someone who is, and then ask them what they're doing, and that can help build your confidence, too. Okay? All right, so uh, that's the uh, entry part. The next, next thing will be the harness, okay? So you'll see a few different... Uh, angles of how to do this. Again, we're just going under the chest. She's and she's like, not going nuts, so she's going to be <laughs> occupied, yeah. They were all <laughs> <laughs> well, a treat, yeah, a treat, yeah. Yeah, so keeping their focus on that, you know, diverts attention. but And then see the looseness, too, so that kind of helps with her having to hold it and then do it. And it makes a big difference. Let's see. Yeah, and this is just another angle of it. But yeah, you can see her focus is totally not on what's happening with the leash. You know? I would say that soft treats. Yeah. 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 yeah, Bill Jack there. Yeah, uh, Bill Jack there. High value stuff. Low, low fat cheese, turkey dogs. Bill Jack, peanut butter stuff. Just make sure of allergies and all that stuff beforehand, but know that this stuff is super high value. Let's use it for the more difficult stuff, right? Also, I know, like, Molly's perfect and amazing. She has an idea, and you're like, not every dog is like that. But if you can spend, like, maybe part of the perks that you offer, if it's kind of a difficult dog, have a conversation with the owner and be like, hey, I'm going to be interested in adding on a 15-minute training session for the dog here. You can work with them on just sitting to get leaked so that that dog eventually becomes like his dog to where it's easy. I think, I think that if we upsell some yeah. of because we have a lot of dogs that will go 
into the lobby and the parent was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I apologize and the dog yeah. And um, I, think, I think we could easily have a 15 minute training session. Like, yeah. you know, we have someone that could, you know, come out and run, blah, blah. Even if it's leash desensitization, right? Or learning that if they even check out the leash, that's good, right? Because by the time they come through these doors, if a dog hates a car ride, that's all factoring into their experience here. Uh, even if it's a walk from the car to the pier, you know, everything is a factor. So keeping that in mind, as much as we can make them as comfortable as possible here, going to go far away. And easier for you. Yeah. Because, exactly. I mean, this is all ideal, right? This is not under a time clock. You guys are under a time clock. You can't spend 15 minutes leashing a dog out unless you have to. You prefer mm -hmm. to spend two because you don't want them waiting. Right. You know? If right. you do teach your, the dog a, a skill during this training curve, make sure, like Rebecca told you earlier, you show the parents how to do it. Board and train yeah. stuff does sometimes work, but most of the time dogs need to be trained with their pet parent, because the pet parent needs to get trained. Right. You can train a dog to sit if you want to sit, and the owners are like, my dog's going to sit. Let me just say, sit. Then you give a hand signal, or you give a different hand signal, or you go like this. And so the dog goes, like, who are they talking about? And then the owner's like, they didn't train my dog, so you have to, even if it's just up front, let me show you what I did with your dog today. Right. Sit. <laughs> That's it, right? Yeah. Or give them handouts or something to take home with them would be huge. Yeah. 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 Education goes way beyond this place. Or know. if we do a video of it, we can share the video. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And people would yeah. absolutely love that if they like saw a video of, of, of them working. Sitting, yeah. If you guys working with their dogs, they would be like, wow. yeah. 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 Dogs are superstar. Sorry. Uh, yeah. What you'll find is if, if you hammer home one skill with a fit, dogs will start to offer it. So instead of jumping up at the kennel door, this is what we do with dogs at the shelter. Instead of teaching them to, and they jump up and go crazy like their normal dog self, we can teach them, like you have to sit before you get out. The, the dog will start to offer it for you. Right. So that when it's excited to get the leash, it's like, okay, okay. Exactly. I'm so excited that I'm sitting. Yeah. And so yeah. It's easy for you to put the leash on them. And you're golden. And then you take that dog out, like this one on the prong collar, you take that dog out, and they're like, oh my god, how did you teach my dog to have this impulse? Like, well, number one, it was like no prong collar on it. Right. That was no factor. This is how I did it. It requires patience and consistency, guys. And you can't do it with everyone because you're working in the But pick and choose the clients that you want to do it on, and then they'll grow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and practice, like she's saying, practice with the ones that aren't tens, you know, and then you can yeah. work yourself up to that point. Yeah. But be realistic too. Um, if there's a fire alarm going off here, okay, it's not going to be easy to put leashes on this dog, but you got to do it. So just be realistic about your environment, about what's going on, okay? Um, which is actually, that's the next thing. So knowing what is going on around you can set everyone up for success, okay? There's a dog hiding around the corner. That dog, you, something needs to be made aware of that there's a dog over there, right? So that way you're not walking one dog who potentially could be dog reactive face-to-face uh, -face into another dog, okay? Um, whether it's dogs barking increases stress, okay? So in our heads we're thinking, okay, potentially this dog could be stressed because of what's going on right now. Um, if they just came in, right, and they're not wanting to be here, okay? Um, we have to take that into consideration, right? As far as handling goes, or as far as leading them, trying to make it their choice to go through things, okay? They're coming through one, two, three, four thresholds, you know, into different spaces, potentially in a short amount of time. I'm not, I'm not sure what the process is, but that's a lot, you know, that's overwhelming. So be reasonable, try to make them as comfortable as possible, and learning what they're trying to tell us, you know, whether it's tail tucking, or maybe they're super stoked to be here, okay? That'd be great. Um, but being aware of what's going on is only going to set everyone up for success. Um, last thing would be, what was I? Oh yeah, announcing yourself when you come around places. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, has anyone ever worked in restaurant industry? Right. Yeah. You say corner. Tray. Exactly. Yeah. Corner tray coming in hot. Yeah. Whatever it needs to be to make it known around corners, doorways, tricky spots to where. All right, now I know there's someone with the dog right there, maybe just hang out for a second right. and let them pass. You know, it's traffic. Uh, but again, being aware or hyper aware, because you know who else is aware? The dog, for sure. You know, 
um, and their nose are lower to the ground, their sense of smell is better than ours, they know what's going on. Uh, but if we can be aware, then we can help communicate with them and build that bond and keep that trust with them. Okay? That's like when Grace and I was working together uh, at night. She would send one out to go out to the yard, and as soon as that one got put right. into the yard, I would haul her back in. Here comes this one. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I mean, the, in, the in and out method we use when yeah. we're not in daycare, we're still mm-hmm. feeding and walking. Just way easier to go down the line. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. You got a, a yeah. cyclical <laughs> yeah. thing going on where you're not having to cross the paths. That. That's it's perfect. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, as far as the transportation goes, um, you know, gauge your dog's level of arousal. Okay. If they're at a 10 right now, it's not going to be as easy to transport them, right? So we have to make adjustments, whether it's a harness, whether it's giving them space, like y'all were saying, um, and kind of letting them cool down or doing some very simple things to get their focus on you rather than the overwhelming sensation of being in a play yard and having to come back inside. Um, because that's a big factor, you know. If there's a site, excitement is at a 10, we have to realize that and then we have to make adjustments. Um, leash tension is a big one too. Uh, if your dog is just going, okay, it's been scientifically proven that the leash tension creates more stress, right? Or it is stressful for the dog. Um, so the more slack we can have, the better. So if that's leaving them with food, right, or showing them something that motivates them to create slack in the leash, that's going to be very helpful, you know. But I understand that these aren't, they're not here for that necessarily, right, and you have to do a job. But as little tension as possible goes a long way, you know, for the dog and for you, especially on slip leads where they're not, you know, choking themselves or strangling themselves. Um, Tricky areas, you know, corners, doorways, thresholds, all those places uh, we just have to be very mindful of where the high traffic points are. You know, and if y'all have a system for in and out, that's beautiful. And that's big time. Um, that's where a lot of places struggle with is like you got people or volunteers running into each other with dogs that they don't need to be within four feet of each other, I'm right? Talking about the shelter right now. Talking about, <laughs> talking about shelters <laughs> yeah. in general. Uh, no place in specifically. Uh, I haven't been to many shelters, but that's just things you notice, right? And then you try to make adjustments or try to coordinate people to go in certain paths when they're doing things um, to prevent any type of interaction or unwanted, you know, confrontation as possible, okay? It's just like people. If, if, if Meredith and I don't get along, don't put me around her, okay? Take me the other way, all right? <laughs> so um, just keeping that in mind, be hyper aware of everything that's going on around you. Um, positive reinforcement engagement. If a dog's out in the play yard and they don't want to come in, Try to make it worth their while to come in here. You know, whether it's when they, if they know when they come into their kennel, there's a few treats laid on the ground, not a lot, but something, then they're like, all right, coming inside is not the best thing ever, but I know what I got waiting on. You know, um, little things like that go a long way, and they do remember that. If every time they go in a kennel, they know there's something good in there for them, they're going to be more willing to want to go in there, and you'll see the progression happening of, not so interested in going into all right let's see and then now all right we got this right um announcing yourself the whiplash game um this is something that we use in one of our classes uh it's pretty easy all we do is toss food on the ground in a certain direction and let the dog go eat it so let's say if there's if this is a corner or a doorway right here and i'm trying to go that way and i have a dog okay i got home all right to make sure that we're the first people to look through that door you're holding his leash good. You can toss a treat over there. He's eating a treat. Now I'm looking. All right, now I'm opening the door. It's just a way to divert attention so that way we can see what's coming you know, before the dog. Okay, Because if, if both of us are out here and then he sees the dog, now we're you know in a situation that we have to calm down um, or get out of there. But making yourself the first thing aware of it or as best as possible, you know, nothing's perfect, um, really goes a long way. Okay? Uh, last thing would be the exit. Okay, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about this and show you a video. Um, getting the slip lead off of a high aroused dog, right? Or a dog that may is not that easy to get it off of, okay? As safely as possible. So, it involves, let's see, it involves the slip lead that's on them and another leash with a clip, okay? Have anybody, have y'all seen, you've seen yeah, this? Seen it. Yeah, it's really cool. I just never remember it's, how to do it. It's a challenge, but it takes a lot of practice too. So I would definitely practice this with a mannequin dog or with a, a calm one first. Um, 
And I'm looking at your kennels, and some of them, those have like little plastic sheets over, or they have something between those. Uh, one like those bars ones. right there? Yeah, it's mesh. It's yeah. mesh. It's, it's mesh? Not open. No, yeah. there's, okay. glass. there's a glass and there's a mesh one. Okay. Like four of them are glass, and then it has like a metal mesh that can't put their head through. Okay. Because so the way it involves taking it off of them, it's basically through an opening in the it floor. Right. Right. Yeah? Okay. That could, yeah, that could yeah. That would be interesting to see. So all you're going to do really, so there, you put them in the kennel and you close the door. All right, now we're on the outside and there's a door in between. Okay? Or take take some steps back. We'll have already clipped this onto the ring of it. Okay, now they're in the kennel and now we're funneling this through the hole in the door or in the opening. Okay? All you're going to do is pull on the ring itself to make that hole bigger. Okay? And I'll show you in these two videos, or one for now, and I'll see you another one. When that opening starts to happen, the dog just kind of slides right out of it, you know? Easier said than done, um, and I totally get that. But this is a way to help us be safe uh, and help it be as little as stressful as possible for the dog, right? Once you get that opening, you can kind of move it a little bit or finagle it. Generally going up is gonna help. The dog will be probably helping. Yeah, that's what you're gonna see here. Is yeah, they're they'll slip their head through and it comes right off. But the idea is set yourself up well before they go in, they're in. Now we're kind of fishing it out and then it slides right off. I do this with scared dogs more than I do with hyperactive yeah. because the last thing scared dogs want is you to touch them or interact with them more. So this minimizes any handling on a scared dog. Right. And do make sure that when you clip this on, I did this with uh, my mom's dog who was nervous yesterday, but when you clip it on, make sure you get it on the ring for sure and not on this, because then we're not making yeah. any progress. And you so. clip that on the ring before you even approach the dog to put it on them. Like, what do you mean? Like, because if it's already a scared dog and you're trying to you're slip lead it, then you're not going to go, oh, dog. wait, scared dog, let me come yeah. clip this on the ring. Yeah, exactly. So if you're right here, yeah. yeah, yeah, you could absolutely pre-clip it. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, when it comes to nervous, anxious dogs, um, fearful dogs, yeah, as little as possible, right. as much prep as possible. That way you only have to do it once at the beginning, and mm -hmm. then you don't have to do it. You don't have to exactly. mess with them again. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a video, and I have one of her, Molly, she's a medium-sized dog, a little bigger than him, and then I have another one we'll send to you guys of a tiny dog, right? And as long as you have a little bit of height to work with, this is just a fence, um, then if you get it up there, you get to the point where that hole's right there, they're gonna slide right out of it, right? So, quickly, we'll show you this. The tiny ones who won't, sometimes are the ones that won't, they're the ones that'll leap up and lunge mm -hmm. and snarl. Yeah. Yeah. Satan dog here? Which one? Satan? No. This one's Satan. Oh, there's like four of them. Oh, how many Satan's are there? Oh, right. He's thinking about Coco, Beth's dog that she grooms. Oh. It looks like Satan, it has orange eyes and it's black. Oh, no. And it's like, I'm not gonna do this. Uh-uh. Yeah. Okay, so just a short video and then we'll get on to playgroup management. Yes, good job. Make sure you ready? Good girl. Yes. Good. Uh, so notice that it's already on, like you said, and all I'm doing is pulling on that long one and holding it high and then whoop, mm -hmm. there it goes. Yeah. She just slides right out of it. So. Um, again, practice is really going to be to your advantage with that, um, and uh, prep work too, like you say. Just um, setting yourself up for success, reading your dog, um, and being as the least evasive ways of doing things as possible. Okay. All right. Let's so see. before I get started talking about this, I want to try and steer this to the questions that you wanted answered. So what are like the, what, what questions do you have specifically about plagiarism management? What are some of the things you struggle with? Um, what are some things that you wish you could do better? I, I, I'll, speak uh -huh. up. I'll say, yeah. it says on my mind or I'll tell for yeah. you. Where I struggle is, and I'm sure everybody else does too, unless uh -huh. it's just me, going out to, to get a dog to go home. Okay. And we've gotten to where they rush the gate okay. and Whoever's going home is uh -huh. getting nipped out of anger. Uh -huh. Other dogs want it to be their turn. Uh -huh. So they're like, 
I don't want her to get to go home before me, so okay. I'm gonna bite at her. Okay. So there is such, it's like everybody's operating out of 10 mm -hmm. at that moment, mm -hmm. and that's, I feel like something might break out at any okay. minute because they're so frustrated that it's not their turn. Okay, so exiting out of play groups, any other questions or specific thoughts? Do you have one? No? Excessive barking. Barking. That you can't control. Okay. Like they're barking for no reason. They're staring at you and okay. they're like barking with their teeth, almost slobber. Okay. I do that. We have one dog that barks at Tammy nonstop. I don't, yeah, don't know why. And she's that. never kicked him. I mean, okay. it's. I've never been mean to him at all. Okay. okay. So it's, it's, it's just me. Okay. It's excessive, it, like the excessive barking. Do you do you remove the dog from play group in order to keep calm? Everybody yeah, well, calm. I'm, I'm going to have these questions in the back of my mind okay. as I'm presenting, and I'll okay. specifically add, uh, address those. Any other ones? No? If you think of any along the way, please shout out. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, so again, I used to work at a doggy daycare for two years. So I was in a play group that had 15 to 20 dogs in it at any given time. Um, we had a different setup. We had bedrooms inside of the play group, and the play groups were a little bit bigger than this. Um, which made me able to have that many dogs out at once. Um, and we also split up play groups based off of size of dog. So that's something to think about too. Um, play group management is all about setting dogs up for success and how they communicate with each other. So just like with people, like you were saying earlier, if him and I don't like each other, it's probably because we just don't communicate naturally well together, okay? I might be always at a 10 and super high energy and wanting to go, 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 extrovert, and he's like wanting to just stay at home and sleep and be an introvert and finds me annoying, okay? So it's, it's, it's the same with dogs. There are some dogs that complement others and some that do not. Um, and I was able to find in my experience working in the doggy daycares and having my own dogs, these are all six of mine right here, that some, <laughs> some complement each other better than others. And so for the ones that naturally don't communicate well, I had to try really hard to make sure that I was there to shape every interaction we had to set them up for success. So like my red and white pit bull terrier here, Max, typical pit bull, hyperactive, balls to the wall, confident, I'll run into a brick wall because I think it's gonna go down. <laughs> Similar to lots of labs, doodles, you know, just ah, crazy energy. My Australian Shepherd hates him, mm -hmm. hates him. And so what I found in doggy daycares, and they saw all stereotypes of the breed, correct, but I found the herding dogs, German Shepherds, Australian Shepherds, cattle dogs, my cattle dog right there, it's the same MO as my Aussie, want to manage that mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. They're like, you are annoying. I don't know how to communicate this annoyance except for chasing you around barking and nipping at your heels. The pit bulls in the lab would turn around and be like, what's up bro, why are you doing that? I wasn't doing anything wrong. And then the German Shepherd's like, yeah you were, let me tell you what you were doing wrong. And the pit bull's like, you better bro. And then there's a huge fight, right? Because they suck at communicating with each other naturally. All right, and it's not because one dog is more aggressive or the other, it's just because their personalities are different. So I can't fault him for being an introvert and me for being an extrovert. He's not an introvert, by the way. We get along fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you have to think of it that way. The German Shepherd's not mean or aggressive. The pit bull isn't stupid or dumb. You just don't communicate naturally. You think of, I don't know if any of you have lots of siblings that you live with. Think of growing up with them, how annoying your little sister or brother was. And you as an older sister just wanted to be like, bye, let me close the room and get away from here. Let me yell at you because I'm so frustrated. You're not listening to me. Or in marriages, any kind of relationship requires lots of communication. That's the key to success. And if we don't have a pair or a group that complement each other well communication-wise, there's going to be issues, right? Which what is why therapists exist in the people world and why daycare attendants exist in the human world. So you guys have to operate off of that way. Let me try and pick out, you guys know your dogs that are here, because you have stories and you're like, that one, Satan, that one, Duke, right? You know your dog, so you're like, I know that dog that comes in is going to hate this one. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get along yeah. fine. They're, that dog's going to find that one annoying, it's going to get stressed out. Right. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. there you go, I'm not going <laughs> to put them together. I'm not even going to try that. Because the goal of doggy daycare should be having a place where the dogs can have fun and make friends, 
right? We don't want to force friendship. How terrible is that? If your mom forces you to be friends with someone else that you don't like, it's going to make you not like them. So let's listen to the dogs telling us that they're uncomfortable. That's a skill that you'll learn. And let's help them. <laughs> it might be that telling that Australian shepherd, look, your Aussie really doesn't like daycare. Right. Oh, it's just funny that you say that. That's the only dog I've had to dismiss oh, as an yeah. for that reason, for yeah. hurting and uh -huh. biting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your dog is just not compatible for daycare or a public dog park, probably. I'm not saying your dog is dog aggressive. I'm just saying this is not his, his gig, right? I think dog parks and doggy daycares are like frat parties on steroids a lot. <laughs> Not everyone wants to do a little frat party, right? Or if you do, you're like there for one hour and it's because you're already wasted and you can tolerate more, right? So yeah, it's the same with dogs. Set them up for success. So, so that's what most of my PowerPoint's about anyway. Okay, so moving on, dog body language. She went over a lot of it. This is kind of putting everything together. The dog face, the dog's body motions, and then the, the trajectory of the dog. So play bells, you all have seen play bells. It's a really great behavior. It means like me saying, hey, everything I'm gonna do to you right now is just because I'm playing for fun, so don't take it seriously. And then they go, I'm gonna jump on you now. And it's okay, right? Don't take it offensively, which is a great communication. The rocking horse run is a very loose, kind of like backward motion, loose body language. So it's a, it's a dog that has its tongue rolling out the side of its mouth, happy and juicy. Flat run is what the Aussies and the border collies and the herding dogs kind of do. It's more intense, like dog chasing after cat it wants to murder kind of thing. It's more serious. Ball. Yeah. <laughs> Lip lick. Again, Rebecca said it's a communicator of stress. It's what a dog typically tends to do before they growl or snap. Um, it's not because it's hungry. It's not because it's licking its dinner off its lips. It's normally because it's stressed. Full body shakes are amazing. It's a good way for dogs to cope with stress. When they shake, they're kind of shaking it off and resetting. So what you'll often see in a play group is dogs play really, really rough together, and then they'll separate, and then one of them will shake. Or um, after it goes to see its owner gets really excited, that was really arousing, and then it'll calm down and be like, shake, and you shake it off, okay? Um, rolling over, we talked about that dog that comes in, rolling over and with one leg open is a, a way for a dog to communicate, I surrender, I'm not gonna be in any trouble, I swear, please, please don't hurt me, I'm non-confrontational. That would be me as a dog coming into play group. <laughs> Okay. Like and yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sometimes these dogs submissively pee um, just to further communicate, hey, really, really, I don't want to be a problem, please, please. And so when you have a dog that's doing this with 10 other dogs over top of it at a gate, that's like what the dog doesn't want. This dog would rather come in and be a wallflower, which is me at a party. Like I am going to come in the door and disappear and find the dog in a corner yeah. and pet it for a little bit, right? <laughs> That's what this dog wants. The twitch always, <laughs> always terrifies me because it's like when they greet each other and they kind of bow up and get stiff and then they shake their tail oh like gosh. this. <laughs> and then you're like, are you gonna fight with each other or play with each other? I don't really know. So that's one that you wanna watch. So if you have a dog come in and they're greeting and you have that really fast twitch muscle movement, count to three, one, two, three. If nothing has happened, no play bow has happened, no full body shake, you want to redirect that dog away and try again. If you let that linger for more than three seconds and there hasn't been any relaxation of body posture, it's probably going to turn into something that's negative instead of positive because this dog's a little bit insecure with himself. Um, and then this is the flirt. This is dogs humping each other. So a lot of the times the twitch, if you let it linger, will turn into one dog trying to posture over the other to communicate, hey, I'm insecure. Let me go out of my way to kind of push your buttons to see what kind of person you are. If you're gonna, if you're gonna turn around and bite me, if you're gonna roll over and be submissive to me, I'm gonna push your buttons because I'm insecure, okay? The flirt is that's the humping behavior. It's posturing over the body, and then they throw one leg around, and bam, and they're humping, okay? <laughs> and that's a way to kind of, I think, to poke at other dogs to try and see, you know, um, what is this relationship going to be like? What kind of a communicator are you? It's a rude behavior that shouldn't be condoned. So in play group, uh, you don't want to yank a dog off of the other dog. You just kind of want to either create a diversion, like, no, let's go over here, 
If that's not working, then literally walk in between them to try and get them off of each other. And of course, if it happens over and over again, and normally it'll be one dog that's humping, that's just MO, and it'll pick one or two dogs to do it to. Yeah. So you just don't have those dogs out together, right? No. Okay. Take all <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. And sometimes it's also because they're really aroused. So they're really excited and they want to funnel that energy into some behavior. Normally it's jumping up and down or barking or playing, but sometimes it's also humping. We have so. two that are new that are little, that are siblings, and mm -hmm. I was like, did I do this at home? Mm -hmm. Constant hum, like, nonstop yeah. hum. Yes. <laughs> and you'll see the difference. I mean, okay. if it's a play bow into a hump, yeah. that's more of like an arousal thing. If it's a twitch into a hump, it's more of an insecure, let me try and feel you out because I'm feeling insecure about you. It's not dominance. A lot of people think it's dominance, and that's not what I'm saying. It's a dog that's insecure and is testing the other dog to see, can I trust you, you know? Um, all right, so these are dogs interacting with each other. So now we're layering this on top. So what kind of body positions are these dogs in, and how are, the, how are they interacting with each other? So like in this picture, you can't tell, but I have each dog lettered and labeled. So these two dogs are playing with each other, and the, the spaniel-looking dog is kind of on the periphery. Um, this Dalmatian is feeling overwhelmed by this border collie thing, okay? So if I saw this in play group, the first thing that I would do is say, if I don't interact, inter interfere with A and B continuing to play and get aroused and over-escalate and get into a fight, I need to make sure that C doesn't add into that fight. So what I'm gonna do, instead of just pulling away A from the situation, I'm gonna try and distract everybody. Because if I take A away, I leave a vacuum here. B is still feeling overwhelmed by, the, by A dog, and probably C is gonna come in and start doing the same thing A dog did, okay? What this dog needs, the Dalmatian needs to be put in the bedroom and take a break, because he just had a really negative experience with A dog. And when you let a dog back out again, you have to watch them to make sure the Dalmatian is not being overwhelmed, okay? Um, picture number two, B and A. A, the collie is very loose, that body's curving, and so he's kind of looking at the Dobro and being like, do you want to play with me? Like, do you? And they might, <laughs> they might like <laughs> jump back like a cat, and they might jump forward into a play ball. And it's very respectful communication. It's like, you're kind of looking at me like I'm 50-50 about you. And so this is one that you're going to want to watch. So make sure that a, the collie doesn't continue to get closer and closer while the Doberman is continuing to say, I'm not comfortable. What you'd love, and normally what happens is, is the Doberman will end up play bowing yeah. and saying, OK, I trust you. Yeah, we can play. You can do whatever you want to me because it's, it's not so serious. This picture. The bee dog is so scared because there's a big Rottweiler that's being very appropriate and playful, very loose, but it's so small. <laughs> I'm sorry. We have a dog that's literally him. It's totally it's, like, it's this one. staff member that's not here. Yeah. Oh, he's he's a dog. dog. And he, like, he's a growler. Like, he'll have a bone in my uh, head. Okay. Yeah. He wants to play with me. And yeah. Like, it's okay. And I'm like, Mm, yeah, his playgrounding so is very off-putting to the other yeah. dogs. Yeah, Two of my dogs went to the daycare I worked so at, and they got they got told that they couldn't play together because their play was so rough that it yeah. made the other dogs uncomfortable. Right. That's yeah. how it is. Yeah, so you definitely remove this dog from the situation. And 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 I should let me rewind. If you touch this dog, so if he's already tiny. If you swoop in to pick this dog up, he's already scared. You swooping in is going to be even more scary. So instead, take a dog away from the situation, okay? This, this picture gives me so much anxiety. This is probably at a public dog park. Um, it's similar to this picture. This, this picture is what happens if this gets left unattended. So B dog, they probably went for chasing zoomies around the play yard, got everyone's attention. He's like, look at me. Can anyone catch me? Can you guys catch me? And these three were like, yeah, I can catch you. And they did catch him. This dog is shaking stress off because he was caught. He might be in a corner. And so these dogs are like, what am I going to do when I catch you? A dog's about to hump him. Um, D dog looks like he's still trying to play. And then C dog's kind of on the periphery and like, I don't know what's going to happen. Let me see and I'll follow suit. Okay? okay. So in this situation, you'd want to just, again, walk into them and try and distract these three and then give this one a break. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, moving on. Um, 
How do we introduce dogs to each other? So these are videos I shot of my own. These are Ivy and Elsie, two of my dogs that can't play together in daycare because <laughs> um, <laughs> they're really rough. Um, this is Smokey, an intact male pit bull that I got from the shelter. He lived his whole life out on a chain, so I didn't know anything about his temperament. And so the first thing that I do is I introduce him on leash. I try and keep that leash loose, and I have Elsie, who is my more chill dog behind a fence. And you can already see in this video his hair is up, so he's already feeling a little bit nervous. It's not automatic aggression. With the hair up, it's nervousness. It's like when you get goosebumps or butterflies, okay? So in this situation, you'll see him get nervous first, and then you'll notice he kind of eases into himself. And you'll see a lot of like uh, appeasement behaviors, like he'll turn his head away from her, and it's him taking a breath a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. Elsie's shaking the stress off right there, you saw. Okay, and then this is Ivy and Elsie playing really rough in the presence of Smokey. So whenever you have dogs in play group, everyone comes in, they're really chill, that's one thing. But the moment fireworks go off and two dogs start playing really rough with each other, again, that's why these guys were kicked out of daycare together, it can set other dogs off. So you always want to test, how is this dog, this new player, going to react to two dogs sounding like they might be fighting with each other? Okay? Because, like, that Australian Shepherd would probably be going to try and separate them. Right. Because it would make her uncomfortable. Oh, shoot. Oh, uh, let's see. I can play it. There So they're playing really rough and they're vocalizing rough, too. He goes over to check it out, but he's not like running into them, you know? He's not matching their energy level, and he turns his head away. So he's like, I'm, it's no big deal, I'm just gonna walk over here. Okay, those two are crazy. All right, so um, this, this again is Smokey and Elsie, and you'll see that he's starting to loosen up because he is in a play bout right now. His butt's not up, but he's still kind of bowing. <laughs> But, oh, but what you'll find is that Elsie starts to get a little bit nervous because Smokey is kind of like in the flirt position, is really intense. So, but he's playful, right? He's trying to bop her head to get her to play. But Elsie starts to get overwhelmed. You see the white of her eyes there? She's up she's against cornered. the fence and she's cornered and Smokey, she knows, wants to hump her, right? Okay. So the next slide, I'm really bad at this. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, these are two of my dogs. This is my cattle dog mix. Sometimes her and Ivy disagree with each other. About three months ago, they got into a fight with each other. So now they're just starting to get back to each other again. So you'll see in this video, Ivy wants to go down there to my basement where they get fed. And Lennox is laying right in front of that entryway. Let me see. She's sleeping. Are you feeling awkward? It's okay. It's okay. Ivy, come here. It's okay. So Ivy is being really proper in her communication with Lennox, and it's kind of analogous to someone kind of tiptoeing around something that's stressful. So this is what you'll see. I want you to try and keep in mind all the stress signals we told you about and read it off of these two dogs' faces. So Ivy's turning her head. She's looking at me. She's like, I don't know, Mom. She's not forward into Lennox. Oh, Lennox perked up. Lennox licked her lips a little bit there. Lennox isn't looking directly at her. Ivy's kind of diffusing with a stretch. Lip lick from Lennox. Ivy's like walking Sada. over a little bit. Uh -huh. Yeah, but not like if my pit bull Terry was there, like the lab, the hyperactive labradoodles, he'd probably run right over Lennox and violate this bubble of boundary that Lennox is having, but Ivy's being more appropriate there. So if you saw that situation and you knew these two dogs had a bad history, you would want to intervene. That would be something that you go to. 
Um, playgroup management. This is ideal. I know you probably can't afford this ratio, but <laughs> it's ideal that one person be um, with, with three dogs. So if you have six dogs in a playgroup, it's ideal that there be two people there. And that is because you want to have one person kind of be responsible for watching three dogs. Because if these dogs got into an argument, you can remove two of those dogs and leave that one okay and diffuse more. Um, when I was at the doggy daycare, I was in charge of 20 dogs at one time. It was just me, and that was not safe. Um, yeah. And then you also like to try and split up play groups because you don't want that Boston Terrier Rottweiler situation happening where they're getting overwhelmed. Um, this is what I talked about earlier about trying to pair together complementary play styles. So you don't want to have orderly dogs like Aussies playing with playful dogs like Lab and Pitbull mixes normally. That's just stereotyping a breed. Um, low energy dogs can chill with everybody because they're really, they're not really interactive, so they're not really threatening, you know? Um, timeouts are great. Um, so if you guys can take a dog that's overwhelmed and put them in a play group, um, taking them in and out of a gate probably would add more stress to the situation. So I don't know if you'd be able to put crates up in here or something like that, just one crate in the corner, and that dog can have a little timeout spot. I thought about doing that. I would just need to have a cover over for any mm -hmm. kind of, you know, fence fighting or anything. And I, what I do at my house, I, it's my special needs corner. I have a crate with my special needs dog in it that needs space. And then I have an X pin around mm -hmm. that yeah. crate so that there's a border. Because, yeah, you don't want any fence fighting. Right. And you wouldn't put any food or toys in there because you don't want to invite any kind of problems. And it's really quick. It's just two to five minutes, enough for them to take a breath. But that's really, really important. And it's not a source of punishment. It's just a break. Um, the rotation schedule, you want to make sure you are rotating the low energy dogs too. So if you have five low energy dogs that come in, make sure that you rotate two and three out with each other. Do you know what I mean? Prevention, you guys know your dogs again, so you never want to put the hyperactive one in with that Aussie, right? <laughs> Complimentary communication. Yeah. Arousal levels, we talked about a lot with body language. If you let a dog linger for more than three seconds hardcore staring at another dog, that arousal level is going to increase into something that's probably not going to be good, okay? Um, play groups. That gate has a strong association with it. They hear that doorbell, and all the dogs probably come running to the gate, or they hear you walking. They hear the back door, and they all run so to the gate. So that's such a tight space. If you have 10 dogs crowded there that are aroused, they ricochet and bump into each other. It's like yeah. a mosh pit. Yeah. You know, mosh pits, these, these aggro guys that are drunk, they bump into each other and they start punching each yeah. other. And so that's what happens here. So that's why crates would be good too. Um, you want to try and either distract the other dogs away from the gate. This is what I did in playgroup. I would recognize a dog's going to get picked up. I'd tell one of my coworkers, hey, can you get this dog? I'm going to distract all the other ones. You run around like a stupid person. Like, woohoo, you know, let's go over here. Yeah. Um, to try and get them away. All right. Um, toys, if you have a dog that is toy aggressive, adding more toys is not going to help. Normally, all the dogs want the same toy, unfortunately. So we don't use toys, really. I mean, that's we, good. It, when we know the group and we mm -hmm. know there's nobody here that's a resource mm -hmm. guarder, we'll throw some, some mm -hmm. toys out. Yeah. But typically, we don't even put any out okay. because we have a few that are going to Yeah, know, that's not good. share. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I imagine fights have happened here before. The only time I've gotten bit by, well, most of the times I've gotten bit by a dog has been separating dog fights. Um, and your instinct, at least mine is, to go and put my hand in and grab the collar. Dogs in this situation are so amped up that they are just going to be in the red zone and just bite at anything moving. It's like that mosh pit again. Or when you're really upset and someone goes, oh, are you okay? No, don't touch me. <laughs> and you smack the person that's trying to help you, right? Um, so the dog that I would remove from this situation is not the one that's getting beat up on. It's this one. I would remove that one first. Well, what about the brown one? That's Because, I mean, the that one's awesome. No, not that one. That one's I would, one. I would, I would remove, I would, yeah. I would remove this one, this brown dog, or the black one. To be honest. What about the one on the left with the blue collar? Yeah, this one, one I would not he's, remove. He's sunk in. And the reason why, yeah, it's not because he's sunk in, it's because if I remove this dog, the black dog's just going to go in and get it. Right. Right? And if it, it's going to take me time to un, unlatch yeah. a dog's teeth out of another dog's body. So the more that I persist in this situation of high arousal, 
All the other dogs are going to come in. I'm going to have three teeth sunk into this Aussie. Mm -hmm. So I better just remove the ones and just say, I will come back to you. I promise, Aussie, I will come back to you and get this one off. Okay? You have to think about that. It's counterintuitive, but me living with six dogs that don't communicate well, I've had dogs that one will cut the Aussie will jump on my pit bull, and then um, I will try and get them apart. All my other girls come running and attack my, my pit bull. So I have to try and calm the situation down. And so I'm picking and choosing. Let me remove the periphery problems, and then I promise I'll take care of you. And if you have play groups that are matched in size, it's incredible, but dogs can take a lot of damage, believe it or not. Right. I don't want that to make you, and this is not what you think, but I don't want you to make it seem like I can lazily walk away. You know, you would think that that's not your instinct. But yeah, remove the periphery dogs and then take care of the situation. It typically sounds and looks way worse than it actually is mm -hmm. once you get to yeah, the end of it. Yeah. Normally, like at the shelter, it's really sad. Someone surrendered two of their dogs in our overnight kennels, and the, they got really over aroused, and so they redirected on each other and fought. I wanted to go in and rip them off of each other. We couldn't. <laughs> My manager had to hold me back from doing it, and so we would spray them with water, do all the things. We wouldn't separate. They were fighting for five minutes, and we could just, we had we were watching it happen. And they separated because they just got so tired. You think of those MMA fights, you know, those yeah. championship rounds, the fifth round, they're the all gas. Yeah, and, and they're, they're just like, busted. they're just like, I can't, it's the stamina. They can't even, like, yeah. they can't even do it anymore. And so normally, they can take a lot. Now, if one gets the eye, I mean, there's something that can go really wrong. So I'm not saying take your time. But what I'm saying is, you know, <coughs> take that with a deep breath and say, let me just get rid of the three dogs and then I'll take care of you. Okay? Any questions about that? I hope that never happens. But, um, and I've already said this. Um, just don't put your hand in the middle of it. That's the worst. The worst scar I have is from me, like Superman driving over a dog I was in the middle of a fight. Um, and then this is just an overarching kind of thing to everything that we said here. Um, talking with dogs is communication. They're not machines. They're not here to be our slaves. They're able to make mistakes. They're here to be our friends and our family. And just like our friends and family make mistakes, the dog should be able to make mistakes. So if we say that the dog doesn't fit, what, what, what did I do wrong? As a human being that's more intelligent, what could I have done to make it easier for essentially this two-year-old with fur to understand what I'm saying? Right? It's communication. Um, yeah. Do you have anything to add? Um, well, then I opened up for questions. Um, I don't know if I answered all the ones that you had at the start. Yeah, I think um, I think with the with the gate, mm -hmm. um, everybody at the gate. If we use two of us and say, which we do this, mm -hmm. I'll say, Maria, call them over there so I can get Perfect. this one dog out. Yeah, we, we do use that strategy. Mm -hmm. And outside, um, it outside, I'm gonna we're gonna a couple with some sort of like run an X pen around the gate yeah. so that there's two yeah, versions of right. getting out of the gate. You yeah. Know, if right. I can keep everybody at an X pen, I get the dog that's going home. Yeah, like, the a, like, like a middle area. area. Yeah. 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 Like a common They area. have that a lot at public dog parks. I know they yeah. have that at yeah. veterans. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. So we can we can work on that. I can put I can get that that'll make it easier. That'll make going home easier. Um, yeah and speed is everything too. So the more that you guys practice leashing dogs and it becomes muscle memory, the faster it'll be for you to put in. Yeah. And doing the X pen, while we have them in that center section, mm -hmm. we can go ahead and leash them there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Instead if, of if trying to run them. If we can get the X pen then open the gate and everybody else is not trying to get out of the gate, yeah. then you can even let them out to the common area at Finley. Because it's just that common area. So, yeah. Okay, right, well, we will email this to you. If you can give us their emails, we can email it to you. And then you, you guys and I will talk about how we can do more, what we can offer, and how to yeah how to bring the partnership further. Yeah, sounds so. good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for letting us come here. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you for coming yeah. so much. Yeah, cool. Awesome.